So welcome and hello and welcome everyone um, to the webcast. So I think that it's time for us to start. Um, this is a webcast on ground reaction force prediction with the anybody modeling system. But uh, before we, uh, we get started, I have a few technical things for those of our attendees who haven't seen these kind of webcasts before. On the right hand side of the screen, you will see a control panel and you can expand and collapse this control banning panel by clicking the small red arrow. Um, inside the control panel you find all kind of settings for your microphone and, um, and, uh, and speakers, but you will also see a questions pane. Um, and if you have any questions or feel that you would like to ask any questions during the presentation, um, don't wait. Ask them right away. Just type them in the questions pane and we'll do our best to, to answer the question either right away or at the end of the presentation, we will try to collect the best uh, questions. And if your question is not addressed, we will try to do so by email. So, so don't hold back, just, just ask your questions. Um, I would like to welcome uh, our presenters today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I might say my name is Morten. I'm an application engineer here at Anybody Technology. And our presenters today are, are Sebastian Skals, who is, um, just started as a research assistant at the Danish National Research Center for the Working Environment. Um, Sebastian used to be a student uh, for our other um, presenter, which is Michael Skipper Anderson. He's an associate professor at the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering at, at Aalborg University in Denmark. Uh, and the outline of the talk today is that I will first just do a short introduction about what anybody is, and then Sebastian will talk about ground reaction force prediction, um, in, in special with regard to sports activities. And after that, um, Michael Skipper Anderson will go into a little bit more te technical explanation of, of the technology that we have here. And in the end, I will, I will give a, a hands-on demonstration of how you can add these kind of things relatively easily to your, um, your anybody mocap models. And finally, we will try to uh, do a questions and answers session and see if we can answer any questions that come in. So first of all, what is anybody and who is anybody? Um, anybody is, first of all, the anybody modeling system. But it's also anybody technology, which is the company that I work for. Um, we, we maintain the anybody modeling system and develop it. Uh, we sell licenses, do training and support, and we do consultancy uh, things as well. But anybody is also... Um, is also the three anybody knowledge centers, which are research groups, which are especially, which work especially a lot with anybody. Um, and first and foremost, it's a, it's a group here at Albert University, led by Professor John Rasmussen. It's also um, the group in the U.S. led by Professor Tony Petrella, and it's a group in Germany, um, led by by Sebastian Dendorfer. And the Anybody Modeling System, it's a modeling system for doing musculoskeletal modeling. Um, and its application spans from gait analysis uh, through product design, economic analysis, even some kind of surgical planning and uh, physiological load cases. Um, but common for all of these examples that you see here is that even though the models can, can calculate the internal forces uh, in the body, we often need to know what are the external forces. Um, and an example of this is, is modeling, uh, doing gait analysis with these musculoskeletal modeling, uh, skeletal models. Um, for gait analysis, we, we, we somehow need to know what are the boundary conditions for our models. We need to know what are the, um, what are the external forces. And in mocap models, this is often provided by force plates. So you have false plates in your lab and you, you record that together with the, the, uh, the marker trajectories and then you can apply the force directly to the model. But there are many cases where this is not uh, feasible. So what do you do if no measurements are available? Um, and this is what exactly what Sebastian is going to talk about now. So um, without further ado, I'm going to give the word to um, to Sebastian. So Sebastian, I've unmuted you now and you should be able to uh, to speak and I'll also make you the presenter now. Yeah, here you go, Sebastian. Yes, thank you, Morten. 
and thank you all for joining us. Um, what I'm going to do today is walk you through a study we recently did where we validated this method for prediction ground reaction force and moments during sports-related movements. Um, first of all, inverse dynamic analysis, musculoskeletal models are by now applied in many fields, as Morton mentions. And um, one of these fields is sports biomechanics. And use this, of course, to try to estimate muscle, ligament, and joint forces doing motion. And traditionally, there's been two ways of doing this, um, one being the so-called top-down approach, where you don't have measurements of external forces. But the problem with this approach is that it becomes underdetermined during double support. Um, so the other solution is, of course, the bottom-up approach, where you measure the external forces using force plates. But the problem with this approach is that this leads to residual forces and moments in the model. So we have some typical solutions to resolve these issues. One being to minimize these residuals through various optimization methods, this being the bottom-up approach. And the other approach is to try to estimate or distribute the ground reaction force and moments under both feet. And some of the previous solutions for the second option has been from 2003 and 2007. Um, where we attempted, it built on the assumption that you have to minimize joint moments, um, but it was only validated for standing positions, and but it's unsure if it works for movement. More recently, in 2013, um, researchers introduced the artificial neural network, which um, unfortunately needs a very comprehensive analysis to determine the input to this neural network and for being able to uh, predict the ground reaction forces. Um, last year, though, uh, René Fluid and others presented this method to predict ground reaction forces in moments, which used a dynamic contact model and solved the ground reaction forces as part of the muscle recruitment. And what is um, particularly good about this method is that it's universal, so it's not restricted to any particular movement and does not require empirical data. The only thing you need is a scaled model and kinematic data. And it has already been validated for an array of activities of daily living. However, none of the existing method methods for predicting gram reaction forces has been validated for sports-related movements. And it's a particularly interesting in sports science research that because force plate measurements are particularly limiting uh, because sports movements are actually are really dynamic and often require a large amount of space. And furthermore, you have larger accelerations, larger forces, and compared to, for example, activities of daily living, you have complex movement patterns and foot-ground contact conditions. So the aim of the study was to evaluate the accuracy of this method presented by René Fluid and others uh, to predict ground reaction force and moments during sports-related movements. So what we did was we performed inverse dynamic analysis of an area of movements common for sports and recreational exercise. And we compared the predicted ground reaction force and moments to measured data, and that being measured by force plates. And we wanted to compare the joint kinetics between these two models. So we had eight male and uh, two female subjects perform five movements which were running at a self-selected pace, which you can see in the bottom right corner. Uh, it was backwards running, a uh, side cut maneuver, which, which is the video on the left-hand side, vertical jump, and acceleration from a standing position, which it was implemented to imitate the in initiation of running. Um, and besides being very common for, for sports, these movements always also provided varying force characteristics, that being force magnitude, force direction. And we also had movements involving double support and single support, and, and tr transition from double to single support. So we performed a marker-based motion analysis experiment with um, eight infrared cameras sampling at 250 hertz. And we use a Qualysis system. 
Um, ground reaction forces were obtained with two empty force plates sampling at 2000 Hz. And 35 reflective markers were placed on the subjects, which you can see in the right hand corner on the pictures. And that is 29 placed on the skin surface and three markers placed on each running shoe. And both the kinematic and force plate data were low pass filtered at 15 Hz. The musculoskeletal models were based on the gate full body template from the anybody managed model repository. Um, the model scaling and model kinematics were obtained using the methods of Michael Anderson, which is first of all, during the scaling, you adjust the segment lengths and the marker coordinates on a model. And subsequently, you minimize the sum of the marker residuals over a complete gate trial or any arbitrary trial, actually, but we used a gate trial in this case. Um, and we, the model had a 20 lower extremity model um, by Klein Horseman and others from 2007, which had simple concentric muscles added to lower extremities. And we resolved the muscle recruitment problem using quadratic muscle recruitment, which is minimizing the sum of squared muscle activities. Moving on to the actual method for prediction of gram reaction forces and moments. So we, as mentioned, we adopted the method of fluid and others, um, but we made some alterations to the method uh, in an attempt to improve it. Um, so overall, this method included, we defined 18 contact points under each foot, which is illustrated in the pictures below. Um, the contact points were placed, as you can see, with, with an offset from the model bone geometry because the subjects, of course, were wearing running shoes. So we had to approximate the position of the contact points according to these running shoes, which is why we offset uh, the contact points on the heel with 35 millimeters and all the other contact points with 25 millimeters. Um, and within these contact points, you have five artificial muscle-like actuators. These actuators were able to generate a normal force and static friction forces. Um, and you have a lot of par parameters you can adjust um, to make this prediction model work. And one being the, uh, the maximal force of the actuators, uh, a threshold distance from the contact points to um, the ground plane, and a threshold velocity, for example. Um, and we just refer to this as contact parameters. Uh, in addition, we had a smoothing function implemented, which was implemented to smooth out the transition um, from the contact point from being fully active or from being um, non-active to fully active. Um, and the ground reaction forces, uh, forces and moments were solved as part of the muscle recruitment algorithm. Um, and Michael Anderson would, would explain this in uh, more detail um, later. So moving on to the models. So here we have the acceleration from a standing position. And you can see this is where we have the transition from double to single support. In this video, we have the side cut maneuver where the subjects had to target a X on the force plate and accelerate slowly up to the force plate and make uh, yeah, an acceleration again when they impacted the force plate in a 45 degrees angle to their left. And lastly, uh, we have vertical jump, which is our completely double supported movement, where you can see the subjects had to hold, fixate their hands on their hips and try to jump at a maximal uh, capacity. And so to the results of this study. So first of all, we have the vertical ground reaction forces, and we have running, backwards running, and side cut on top, and we have the jump trials and the ASP trials with the right, left, right leg and left leg um, showed separately. Um, and the um, measured ground reaction force moment are indicated with red and predicted with blue. And the shaded areas you see are plus minus one standard deviation. Um, in addition to Comparing the values with uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient and root mean square deviation, we also computed the P 
peak forces for the vertical ground reaction force and the resultant joint reaction forces and statistically compare these variables. But as you can see, the uh, correlation coefficients were excellent across all movements, ranging from 0.97 to 0.99. But however, um, for the majority of the variables, the peak forces were actually significantly different, which I will try to explain later on why this might have happened. And here we have the lateral ground reaction force with correlation coefficients rating from 0.13 to 0.96. And you can see the low correlation coefficients are mainly caused by the very low magnitude of uh, this force, for example, running and backwards running, which of course increased the influence of noise on the correlations. But as soon as the magnitude of the force increased, for example, in side cut on your top right hand corner, um, the predictions were actually very accurate. And um, this is the correlation coefficient of 0 0.96. And here for the sagittal ground reaction moment. And as you can see, one, one thing that strikes the eye is the ASP for the right leg. And this is where the foot ground contact determination uh, might have failed us quite a, a bit. This is the, um, the rear leg during this movement. And as you can see, it might have not been activated like it not have not um, hit the activation level uh, accurately enough since um, since the magnitude is much lower. <clears throat> but here is again we have correlation coefficients ranging from 0 0.69 to 95, so fairly good results as well. Moving on to the moments, joint moments. Here is the knee flexion moment, which has very strong correlations as well, from 0.86 to 0.95. And this was the result across all the um, the majority of the moments for the ankle, for the knee, um, and for the hip, of course. Lastly, we have the hip resultant joint reaction force, which is again representative for all the resultant joint reaction forces, which show similar results to this. But here we have correlation coefficients ranging from 0 0.78 to 0 0.94. But again, we see a significant dif difference between the majority of the peak forces. So, to, uh, in summary, we found comparable results for the vertical ground reaction forces, joint flexion moments, and the resultant joint reaction forces across all the movements. Uh, however, the majority of the peak forces were significantly different. But one possible solution for this is actually adjusting the contact parameters, which I mentioned before. Um, and you can try different solutions or different combinations of these contact parameters, which might actually increase the accuracy of the predictions compared to this study. Um, furthermore, we had we observed some dis differences between some variables, for example, the transverse ground reaction moment and the hip external rotation moment. And as I mentioned before, it was mainly because the low, the signal to noise ratio. But it was also because um, we always only had a simple knee model in the study, which was hinge joint. Um, so, of course, when it didn't allow for in, internal external rotation, uh, it of course affected the transverse ground reaction moment and the hip external rotation moments. So areas the study could be improved is the foot ground contact determination because of course we approximated the position of the contact points um, to compensate for the soft tissue under the heel and the running shoes. And you can benefit from a more detailed description of the exact location of the underside uh, of the foot or the footwear used. And a more detailed knee model, as I mentioned before, as well as a de more detailed foot model, um, specifically a foot model which allows bending of the toes, which could be particularly important for, for example, vertical jump, to increase the accuracy of the predictions near toe off. And as I mentioned before as well, the a sensitivity analysis on the contact parameters uh, could be very beneficial to use before you apply the model to find an optical, optimal combination for, for your particular study. So in conclusion, um, we are very confident that this method can be used instead of force plate data for many applications. 
which is uh, very, very beneficiary because this could be an alternative to multi-setting instrumentation of force plates in, for example, outdoor environments, in uh, workplaces, or in analysis on treadmills, treadmill walking or running. And of course, you can use this method in combination with motion analysis systems that not just does not typically um, provide an interface between force plate and kinematic data. Um, for example, electromagnetic tracking systems, uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes. Or, and a very exciting perspective, uh, in our opinion, is the combination with markerless systems. Uh, as, for instance, the, um, the system proposed by Martin Sandow and others last year. And what you see on the videos uh, below is actually because we, in a previous study from last year, we introduced an interface between a markerless system uh, and, any, and the antibody modeling system. So this interface does already exist. Um, and in this case, this was a combination of two Kinect sensors. But other markerless systems, of course, can be used as well. And when you have, thank you for, um, for joining in again. Um, and I will hand the, the, the mic over to Michael Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I will try to make, uh, make Michael uh, the, um, the presenter now. So, Michael, you should be able to, to speak now. And um, I will make you the presenter as well. Thank you very much. I hope my presentation shows up. So thank you, Morten, for the introduction, and thank you, Sebastian, for for showing your your very nice results. So I have been given the task of of explaining how this this method works. I just need to minimize this one. Um, yeah. So if we just start with a little basic uh, mechanics, prolonged friction. So if we look at the little box here on the on the right hand side. That could be uh, experience some external load here, F1 and X2 being external load. And it's sliding on or actually sitting on a surface with friction. Then the, the normal force will of course be pushing uh, normally to the, to the ground and uh, the friction force will be in balance with the, with the force F2 pulling in, in the opposite direction. There are some, some limitation to these forces, so the normal force can only be be positive or in, in, in one direction, so it's a unilateral force. Um, the friction force and the normal force will be perpendicular in this case, and also the friction force will be limited by the amount of normal force. So if you don't have a normal force, you cannot have a friction force, and the amount of friction force you can have is the friction coefficient times the normal force. This is very, very basic, um, basic very basic mechanics. Another thing we, I would like to recall before we get into how we do this is muscle recruitment in these types of models. So if we just look at a model like the one we see on the, on the right hand side, is a model of the lower extremity which has a lot more muscles in, in the model than are, is strictly necessary to drive the degrees of freedom. So we typically have many more muscles in the, in the model because we do that in, in reality than we do have degrees of freedom. Um, the typical approach in inverse dynamic is to then assume an optimality criterion for how to distribute the load between the different muscles, um, and we formulate that as optimization problems. So this is what is up here in the top left. So we minimize some function of the muscle forces, and then subject to the fact that we need to satisfy neutrino and mechanics, which we can describe as a coefficient matrix C, times the unknown forces, which are the muscle forces and joint reaction forces, later on also the ground reaction forces, and all the external loads, which are in D here. So that will be all the external load and all the inertia forces. And the last thing to, to put on here is that all the muscle forces have to be positive, so muscles can only pull, they cannot push. Two typical approaches to, um, to, to to put in this objective function that have been used in quite a few studies. The typical one is actually a polynomial one that you see down in the bottom with either polynomial power 2 or power 3. And the formulation is that we typically have the muscle forces normalized by their strength, which could either be the PCSA or it can be uh, the, the instantaneous strength that's estimated by a hill type muscle. So we, so we typically have a force, the muscle force divided by a strength, and then different formulations on that. 
So either minimize the maximum of those or minimize the power and then the sum over all the, over all the muscles. So what typically goes in the objective is a normalized force, so force normalized by strength. Um, so how have we then tried to, within this basic framework, to represent what I said on the first slide, so what would be like a true Coulomb friction component. So, so what is implemented is basically on the, if you look at this plane here, so we have the xy plane is the, the plane in which there is friction and then the set direction is the normal force to this, uh, to this plane. So then in the normal direction we have introduced five forces so F1 to F5 here, and to four of these, F2 to F5, we have linked a normal force, so that the, the, the so we have linked a friction force, so that the friction force in, for instance, the red direction here for F5 is equal to F5 times the friction coefficient. We have the same for F4 and F3 and for F2. And then we have introduced the last one, which is F1, which can then be a f just any positive force. So then if you sum these up, then you get that the normal force will be the sum of all the five forces, and the friction force will be the friction coefficient times the remaining four. And then all these forces have to be positive. So what this is going to give you is that the normal force is always bigger than the friction force, and all the, the, and all the normal force can only be positive. Um, so this gives the, the basic concept of what I have in, in the first slide. There's a limitation to this, but I'll, I'll come, back to, come back to that. But then if we look at a, a dynamic situation like a guy here walking down the stairs, then clearly he cannot always recruit the, um, the friction forces or the normal forces because he's actually not touching anything. So you can only recruit the forces when you're actually touching the stairs in this particular case. And the way we have introduced that is actually to implement the, each element here at, as muscles, so they have an associated strength. So if they're not touching, they have no strength, and if they are touching, they have a large strength. Um, and, and when are they then touching? This we have defined based on two criteria. So the node has to be intact, inside this contact area, so when the node is close to where it can touch, that is one criteria for for actually being able to have a contact force. The other one is that the node has to be, the node velocity has to be small. So which means that we are, ha we are, we are in a situation where we can assume static equilibrium in the, in the model. Um, yeah, as I said, so then we control the, the, these contact nodes by muscles. So we control it by controlling the strength. So if you look here in the bottom right hand corner, we have a set of nodes could be any number of nodes. I think there are 12 in this illustration, but there could be more or less. I think Sebastian had 18 in his study. So then what would happen if we just have this criteria and that we are close to the ground and the velocity is low is that for some situation there is no contact, so the strength of this particular node would be zero. And then when we have heel contact, it would switch from zero to the maximum strength, which would then be a much larger number than the then the strength of the muscles in your model so that the contact is basically for free when it's possible to get it. This will of course lead to discontinuities in the solution. If we just have, it can have no contact and then have full contact in there. Um, so we have int introduced different approaches to try and smooth this effect. In, in the paper that uh, Sebastian mentioned, we, we we did a post-processing of the kinematics. So we first ran kinematic analysis to find the blue curve here. And then we decided that three samples before and eight samples after contact, we have a, a cosine function that then smooths it out. That will be one approach to doing it. In the, in the paper of, uh, well, in the work that Sebastian did, we tried to do it based on the node velocity as well because we know that the velocity of a node will be slowing down as it gets into contact. And then you can use that to build up the, the, the strength also. So a different approach to how to smooth out these transitions exists as well. Um, so there's a little... Sorry about that. I just uh, got disconnected. I hope you can hear me again. So I'm online. So I hope this is the slide I, I was at. So I was about to say, there is a there's a limitation in the implementation that we have that we have made for this uh, for this contact. 
So if we look at look back in, in 3D, the, um, the true situation is what is called a friction cone, um, where the, the size of the, of the friction force in all directions is limited by the normal force. So it would basically generate a cone if you vary the, the, the normal force. And it would be the size of the force should be smaller than the friction coefficient times the, the size of the, of the normal force. Um, this is what is known as a second order cone constraint that we cannot handle within our normal musculoskeletal or muscle recruitment formulation. So, so what we have instead is a possibility that the, the force on the, uh, on the directions not in the two main directions here can be larger than, than the friction coefficient times the normal force, but it's still bounded by, 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 this, uh, by this triangle, triangle as, as such. Um, so that's of course a, a limitation in, in the implementation. Um, then I would like to show um, a few results as well, um, just just to also point out that we have already looked at this also for other activities of daily living, also getting good results, and not only sports, that Sebastian showed. So this was a, a, a study I presented at the World Congress of Biomechanics in Boston, and I've only shown a few of the results, and then there's a paper in Journal of Biomechanics about it where you can find the rest. Um, and this was a, a collaboration between a lot of people, so John Rasmussen and I from Aalborg University in Denmark, and then researchers from, from Weidbart, in, uh, Weidbart University Medical Center in Nijmegen, and also from the University of Twente in, in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, so the setup is basically the same as Sebastian had in his uh, sports uh, activity studies, where we had, we had nine healthy subjects, four males, five females, and we had gate lab data in, in a similar way. We had full body marker set, 53 markers, six camera of icon system sampling at 100 hertz, and two arm force plates at, at 1,000 hertz. And then we recorded typical activities of daily living. So walking at a comfortable speed, also walking at a slow speed, which was 30% slower than the comfortable walking speed, which was self-selective, walking faster, 30% faster, we also had some walking over obstacles of different sizes, 10, 20, 30 centimeters, gate initiation and termination, deep squat and stair ascent and descent. I will only show the results for the ground reaction force for walking, and the rest of the results can be found in the paper that I will refer to later. Um, Method-wise, we did basically the same. Uh, Sebastian used the anybody modeling system. We used a new version of the Twente Lower Extremity Model, which has just been published in Journal of Biomechanics here in 2015, um, which hopefully will come out too in, in, in a new version of the repository. And it had hill-type muscle models in, in all the uh, muscles in the lower extremity. Um, then we did the same, as Sebastian said. We, uh, we scaled the segment length and the marker position based on optimization over one uh, gate trial, so we selected one gate trial per subject, and then we scaled the model to fit that, and then we reused the segment length and marker positions for the rest of the trials. Contact is exactly what I just uh, told, so we did Coulomb friction model, we modeled the normal and static friction forces with these muscle-like actuators, we had 12 contact nodes under each foot, node was in contact when it's close to the ground and the velocity was small, and then we smoothed the transition from not contact to contact and the other way around by controlling the strength of, the, of, of these muscles. And last but not least, um, we introduced residual muscles or very weak actuators on pelvis with low strength. Um, the point being that it can happen that the, that the node is not in contact exactly as the force is needed or the combinations don't exactly add up. And in that case, the simulation would break down if we didn't have these. The point should be that they should remain small throughout the simulation, and it's just to make sure the simulation will give results, even though the contact was not modeled completely accurate. And of course, it's, it's a very good idea to check these afterwards and make sure that they are insignificant compared to the main forces in the model. Um, yeah, then we did the... Uh, Simulation, uh, simultaneous co uh, computation of the muscle, joint, and ground reaction forces. Um, a very important thing when we do these types of models is the distribution of the mass and the inertia properties of the, of the body, because it's 
only the, the motion capture data and the mass properties and the mass distribution that actually determine the ground reaction forces in this particular case, together with the friction coefficient. Um, so all the masses were distributed according to the regression equations of, of winter, and the uh, center of masses were estimated and scaled from the, from the cadaver data for this particular um, cadaver study. We used uh, length mass fat scaling, uh, which was reported by Rasmus and Nell, that is typical in our model, and then we used the sum of muscle activities cubed for a muscle recruitment uh, What did we then compare? Uh, we compared the ground reaction forces and moment. So the forces were compared in the force plate reference frame, and to compare the moment and make it independent of where on the force platform that the subject steps, we took the, the ankle joint center and then projected that down to the surface of the force platform and then found an, equi an equivalent moment around that point. And then those are the moments that we then compare. Um, we also compared the joint moments, but I, I will not show you the results here. Um, and metrics, we computed the root mean square deviation, or the difference, and we computed the correlation coefficient. And then we just, similar to Sebastian, did a, a statistical test on the mean and the peak. Um, so results, so as I said, I will only show the results for gate. Um, this is, um, if you look at the top row, those are the forces. So the vertical ground reaction force, anterior posterior force, and the medial lateral force. And the bottom, we have the moments, so the sagittal ground reaction moment, frontal ground reaction moment, and the transverse ground reaction moment. Um, the black line is the mean of the experimental data, and the thin lines above and below is plus minus one standard deviation over the subjects. And then the shaded gray is the predicted forces. So in general, we actually obtained very good results both for the forces and the moment. And the only case where we got a significant difference in peak and mean were for the transverse ground reaction force, uh, sorry, for the transverse ground reaction moment, which is also the smallest moment and possibly explained by the, by the simple knee model we had in, in this case. And that was the same for all of the activities we did. It was the only difference we saw was in the, in the, ground, in the transverse ground reaction. Um, oh, then I wanted to skip these slides, but so I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So I just want to conclude. Um, so we, in general, found very good agreements between predicted and measured ground reaction forces and moments. Um, as I said, we found the poorest results for the transverse ground reaction moment, and this is likely caused by the, uh, by the knee being modeled as a hinge in this particular case, especially because it doesn't allow internal and external rotation um, in the knee. Uh, there are lots of potential applications of, of this method because it's, it's universal. So one is the predictive methods or predictive models, where if you par parameterize the kinematics, then you can now compute what forces go with this new altered um, kinematics. Uh, there's also, I think, a very good opportunity in using it together with inertial measurement units, for instance, accents, uh, in this particular case where you can then go outside the lab. Another possible application is treadmill gate without force platforms, um, which I think has a lot of application as well. And last but not least, it's, it's actually also an opportunity to obtain dynamic consistency in inverse dynamic simulations, which you normally don't have when you have ground reaction forces as input to these models. Um, I would like to point you to a couple of papers as well. So the first one, the, the Floyd uh, paper in Journal of Biomechanics last year that I mentioned, where you can find the results for this. There's also another paper published last year that has some results comparing to insole type pressure mats as well, also doing walking in Journal of Biomechanics. And then of course the, the results and the study by Sebastian Scales can be, um, either be downloaded from Auburn University's website, his master thesis, or it's also available on the Anybody Tech website. Um, and with that, I would like to hand the word back to, uh, to Morten, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so I have to switch to my, uh, switch to my own presentation again. Two seconds, guys.
Uh, so, see where we came from. Yes. So, yeah, the next thing we're going to do is uh, a little hands-on um, to show you how you can actually do this in your existing antibody models. Um, but before we do so, I, I also want to urge you, if you have any questions, please ask them. Now's a good time um, while I do all of these hands-on things. Um, open the control panel on the right side, find the questions pane, and, and type your, your question. Um, then, before I actually do the hands-on, I'm also going to say that the code that was used by uh, uh, Michael and Sebastian is, is not currently part of the Anybody Man model repository. Um, and it's also quite hard to set up, at least in the format that they used it. But what we have done now is to wrap everything in an easy to use, um, um, some easy to use AnyScript templates should make it relatively easy to add these kind of things to existing models. And I'm gonna show, show this in a, in a second. Um, and to find this code, um, you can download this from our wiki site. So you have to go to wikianyscript.org um, and there you find a small link that says add ground reaction force predictions to a model. That will bring you to this document here, um, which will take you through the whole process. Um, but I will also walk, walk through this a little quickly now so, so you can see how it's done. Um, I'm just gonna go out and show you um, the wiki page here, this, and um, if you look down across the page, you will see that there is this small link at ground reaction force prediction to a model. That will open the page you see here. Um, it's kind of like a small document that describes the process. It also has links to where you can download the files. Um, tells you what to do with the files, what to add to the model, and what to change. But um, I'll, I'm going to show this now uh, uh, directly in anybody. So the model I've loaded here is the, um, is the, is the default uh, mocap model in anybody. The full body model because the full body is important when you do these kind of things. You need to have the kinematics of the whole body. Um, but in this model, as you can see here, we have um, force plates. So for default, it uses force plates. So the first thing we have to do in order to do ground reaction force prediction with uh, this model is to remove the force plate. Um, I'm going to do this by finding the plates here in the model tree. You can see we have environment model, and inside here we have three plates. Um, clicking one of the plates and then clicking on this small construction link will take us to the code, place in the AnyScript code where this is defined. So we open up this file here. And um, you can, uh, we're just going to select all of these three constructs, which are the templates that adds the false plates. And I'm going to comment them so, uh, and, and save the file. So the next time we load the model, the false plates will be gone. The next thing you have to do is, is look in the main file here. The main file is what I, ha what I have open here. Um, and we need to add some stuff. First thing we need to add um, is to include all of the files that actually do this uh, foot plate uh, 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 of <laughs> ground, uh, ground reaction force prediction. Sorry about this. Um, um, and these files are the ones that you can find links to, to download. I'll, I will show you. Here I have the file explorer open. Um, and this is a default mocap model in anybody. The files I downloaded are the ones that are in this folder on the top that's called GRF prediction. Um, so these are the files that you have to download and unzip here. I'm just going to close this again and go back to the model. So in the top of the model, we in include a single file. And that will, that will take, basically take care of most of the things of, of getting all the necessary files set up. The next thing we have to do when, when we've done this is that we need to change a few things when it comes to the inverse dynamics model. So we go down to the bottom of the main file here. We find this section where it says if inverse dynamic model. So this is the part where it actually loads the inverse dynamic model. And we have to change a few things here. And these are the lines that you see here. I'm just going to comment those in. Um, there are two parts here. You see the first line, it says uh, main study, inverse dynamic study, model environment connection. That opens up the, the folder in the model tree where we want this code to be placed. And then we're including two, um, two AnyScript files here. And 
the bottom one, the one that says weak residuals, that is that handles all the um, the residuals which are added to pelvis for the model. Um, as Michael mentioned, in the default mocap model, we have um, we have some hard reactions on the um, on the pelvis of the model that take any inconsistencies between the model and the ground reaction forces. That cannot be used when you do ground reaction force prediction. So we add these kind of weak actuators um, on pelvis that will take any forces which cannot be carried by, by the muscles or the, the um, actuators uh, under the foot. So this is just a file that you have to include. But the actual file where people will have to change something is the one uh, above, this is where we, we it says GRF example, and I will just open this to show you what it's all about. Um, if I open this file here, you will see that in the top there is a lot of documentation of how to use these AnyScript templates, and if we scroll down, we see two constructs here. Um, the first one is for the right foot, and the second one is for the left foot. Um, and if we look here for, for the right foot, all it really takes to, this is this is all the code it really takes to add ground reaction force prediction at the moment. So what you need to do is you need to um, you need to use this foot plate conditional contact class and then create the object. Um, and this class it takes in some arguments here um, in the top. The first one is this plate base frame. That's a reference to the coordinate system where you have your base plate, it's basically the walking ground. In this case, we are using the global reference frame for this because it's placed at ground level. Um, the next argument is the normal direction. This is the normal direction to the ground plane that we are walking on. That's important to supply. Then we need, we need a reference to a folder that has all the nodes that we want to, to um, put in contact with the ground plane. Um, in this case, it's a reference to a folder called footnotes. I'll get back to that. And we need an argument here which tells us how many nodes there are. So, so this is basically all it takes. Of course, now we also need to create these nodes, uh, these footnotes. And that is done by this class you see here inside the other class. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that could have been done manually, creating these 25 nodes under the foot. But in this case, there is a class to do it uh, easily. And it, basically, these classes are like macros. They, they expand to a lot of any script code. But this class will create 25 uh, nodes uh, under the foot. And to do so, it also needs to know which foot to do it. And it has this foot ref argument. And uh, in this case, it points to the right foot. So it will add all the necessary notes. And those notes will then be used to set up the ground reaction force prediction. This, this is basically all there is to it. There are a lot of more settings that you can set with these, uh, with these uh, templates. Uh, an example is here for the left foot. There is a settings folder that you can open, and you can you can set a lot of settings. And all of these settings and what you can tune are also documented here in the top. And you can uh, find all of those settings as well uh, described at the bottom of this uh, document that we are linking to. So um, I think this really brings us uh, almost to the end of the presentation. I'll go back to my uh, presentation here. Yes, it brings us to the end, um, and time for questions. But before we do that, I, I also want to um, direct your attention to some of the upcoming events we have here. Uh, the 27th of October, we have another webcast on load analysis of the hip joint for occupational activities. Um, so if any of you are interested in these kind of things, I highly recommend it. Um, if any of you are going to the Conference of Human Factors in Engineering, um, in, in Los Angeles, um, and you want to schedule a meeting, just um, send us an email on sales at anybodytech.com. And if you have any other things that you want to see, you can uh, visit our website. And uh, the recording of this webinar, I think we will also make available uh, on the website.